I remember growing up that Christmas was such a special time to me that as a kid, you always get excited because you know that the presents are going to be coming and the gifts are going to be coming. You know that they're going to be so amazing. They're going to be such, so much fun to play with. And so eventually November, October rolls around. I'm like, okay, I'm ready to start asking my parents, start sowing the seeds of things that I want. And so uh, as a seven-year-old boy, the toy that in my mind what was the best ever were Transformers. Transformers, best toy ever. Because for a boy, think about it. There are really two toys for the price of one. You have a car, but then you also have a robot. So of course, I'm obsessed with it. It's the best thing ever. And so I told my parents, like, this is what I want for Christmas. I want Transformers. And they're like, Okay, and so eventually Christmas Day rolls around, you're getting ready, I'm opening the presents. So what I find beneath the wrapping paper, that's not just any old Transformer, it is Optimus Prime himself. Ooh, yeah, I know, oh yeah, actually, I was expecting more, ooh, Optimus Prime, in case you don't know, the leader of the Autobots, the most powerful Transformer there is, he is something to behold, but it wasn't just regular Optimus Prime, it was the full Optimus Prime that was the semi, the semi truck, and it was also him that he had his trailer that had his command center and all of his gadgets and gizmos, that it was really something magical for a seven-year-old brain that I couldn't really comprehend what was really going on, that I just asked my parents for this, um, for this gift, and they'd give me something um, that was hard to really comprehend, that when I asked them that, that there was just this base trust that my parents would give me this gift, and I would receive something amazing, and I did. I received such a good gift, and it was actually for us through prayer that we're able to do somewhat of a similar thing, that we're able to connect and we're able to communicate with our heavenly Father, that we're able to go and to ask him and um, for gifts for ourselves, and we're able to receive them as well through his goodness and through his graciousness. And today we're gonna be talking about this idea of what does it look like to ask and receive gifts from our Heavenly Father as we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount. So uh, thank you for being here. My name is Pastor Garrett. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Spring Lake. Usually I'm at our downtown campus. Um, so I'm over our student ministries and our young adult community is here. And so if you haven't seen me um, here at Bellevue, I've been preached here for about almost two years. And so I'm glad to be here. Um, and so there's probably a lot of faces that you're like, I don't know who this strange young man is on the stage, but I'm glad you're here. For those that are viewing us online, I haven't seen you in almost two years, so it's good to see you as well. Um, but um, before we continue, uh, let me pray for us this morning. Lord, we thank you just for this opportunity that we can slow down and we can really dive into your word this morning, that we can push out all of the distractions um, that are in our life, maybe some of the anxieties that are gripping our heart, that we can just come here and we can place them at the foot of the cross, and we can just learn from your precious word this morning. Lord, I just pray that you would just soften our heart and open, your, open our ears to what you have us, and for what you have to say to us this morning. We pray this all in your name, amen. So the main idea that I wanna be tackling in this passage is that when we pray, our holy heavenly Father hears and gives good gifts. That when we pray, our holy heavenly Father hears and gives good gifts. And I'll be like, Jesus has three instructions that he wants to give us today um, about praying to our Father. And so we're going to be in Matthew 7, uh, verses 7 to 12. So you can turn in your Bible or turn on your Bibles. Uh, you can go to the Version Bible app and go to the events and you can... Uh, go and there's Spring Lake Church, uh, Bellevue and, and downtown. Don't go to down. Don't don't go to downtown. Go to Bellevue and come uh, and you can go there. Um, but give me just a little bit. I'm gonna take this off because it's distracting. So technical difficulties. That's okay. That's why we're here because God is in control, that he is bigger than any uh, distraction that's going on, any technological difficulty, that we serve a wonderful, big God. So um, let me read for us today. We're gonna be starting in verse seven, going through verse 12. It starts, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find it. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. 
Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and prophets. And so Jesus starts out this section of text with this kind of this repetitious wording. Ask, seek, knock, receive, find, knock, open, door. And it can kind of feel a little confusing and a little bit overwhelming of like, okay, what is going on? Who am I asking? What am I trying to seek? What am I gonna find? Where's a store? How loud do I knock? What exactly should I be doing? But I don't think Jesus wants us to see a coded message. He doesn't want us to see like, ooh, hear all these words. And what does it actually look like to ask? And what and how, how should I seek? And what does it look like to knock? That these are not different types of prayer um, that we have to do, but I think what Jesus wants us to see is that he's, this whole, all of it is talking about prayer generally, and that it's not about figuring out and doing all these specific prayers, but instead he wants us to see what is actually happening with the prayer, that these prayers are being fulfilled. For the one that asks, they receive. For the one that seeks, that they find. And for the one that knocks, the door is open, that every time someone goes forth in prayer, that the prayer is then answered, that there is, uh, comes to fulfillment. But we see that um, for our prayers, the same way, that if we aren't praying at all, that there's not a way that our prayers are going to be fulfilled. It brings me to my first instruction, that we must communicate with our Father, that we must communicate with our Father, that Putting it simply, we need to be praying. That Jesus is not trying to convince them that they should be praying throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, This is the second time that Jesus is talking about prayer, and it's not as if Jesus is like, hey, um, this is, I really want you to pray. I really think it's really important that you are doing it. No, he just, when he talks about prayer in Matthew 6, he says, hey, when you go pray, don't be like the Pharisees. There's already the assumption that his followers are going out and praying. And right now he's telling them, ask, seek, knock, that they are doing these active verbs right now, that they are already going out and praying. Jesus is not trying to convince his people that they should be, uh, that they should, um, that they should be praying. He already assumes that they are. And I know sometimes in our life, um, prayer can kind of fall to the wayside in the back burner, that it feels a little bit more like an afterthought in our lives, that we don't treat it with the importance of um, what it really is. I know for me sometimes it's already once I'm in the middle of a project that I'm like, oh, shoot, like hold on, let's like take a step back and now let me actually pray and bring God into the middle of it. Or it's like the project's already done and I'm like, ah, I did a great job. And then I'm like, ah, but... I, I really should have brought, I really should have brought God into the midst of what I am going through. But many times we don't. We treat prayers like that thing that you know you do it you do it when you're at bedtime or it's around the dinner table or only when I'm really really struggling. Then am I going to bring God into the midst of it? We don't actually see it as something that is so vitally important. It's the way that we are able to communicate with our Father. But prayer is so incredibly important to following. Christ, like I said, it's how we're able to communicate with the God of the universe. And as Christians, we like to use this language that like, we have a relationship with God. Um, just like we have a relationship with um, a friend, we have a relationship with our God. But I don't wanna ask you, if you were to take a step back and you would look at this relationship with God and compare it to a relationship, say, with your spouse, would you really consider your relationship with God to be a relationship? Let's just think about this. Imagine if you communicated with your spouse the way you communicate with God. You can, imagine if you communicate with your spouse maybe only a couple times a day, where it's like, ooh, it's dinner time, thank you for this wonderful meal, and then you don't say anything. <laughs> or it's like bedtime, and you, and, you lean, and you roll over in bed and you say, wow, thanks for this awesome day, and you <laughs> roll back over. Or imagine it's only when you really need something. You're like, ooh, honey, we really need milk. (laughs) Okay, so, (laughs) right? Or like, ooh, hey, I'm really struggling. Can I talk to you right now? Or imagine if it's 
always talking and never listening. Some spouses might say that already is happening right now, that all they do is talk, they never listen to what's going on in my life. We always tell them what's going on, but you never sit still to hear from God. Imagine if we think about that type of communication. Would we really say that it's a relationship? Probably not. We actually, I would say is we're more treating God like a vending machine. They're more like, ooh, what sounds good in the vending machine right now? Ooh, ooh, like some comfort. Ooh, A12 comes down, right? Or like, ooh, actually, I just need some mercy right now. That's really what would be good. Ooh, B6, right? We treat God more like, you know what? I need something from you. It's more just transactional. Please help me in this. And then once we get it, we're like, okay, sounds good. I will go on with the things that I want to do. But the reality is if we want to be in this relationship, then we need to put communicating with God as a priority that we need to make sure that we are constantly praying and talking with our Father. But we know that. We know that some, I know we're, I'm probably, you're probably like, Garrett, I know, I know, I know, and I'm beating you over the head. But then there's a reality that sometimes that we still don't pray. That we know these truths, but there's still something that's within our hearts that is stopping us from communicating and talking with our Father. There's plenty of barriers that we just feel like it's hard, or maybe we just don't want to communicate with him. I think a couple of reasons why people don't want to pray um, is firstly, maybe we just struggle to believe that it works. That we have prayed to God, that we've asked him so much for this certain thing and we didn't get it. And so now we struggle to believe who God is who he is, that he actually cares about us. And so we got burnt once and we decided, that's it, I don't, I tried and it didn't work. Prayer's just not for me, it just doesn't work. Or maybe that we just want to do, do it on our own, that the idea of reaching out to others, it's just not how we work, that we were taught that we just need to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps, that we just, need to, uh, we just need to bite down, we just need to grind ahead, and it's just, it's all about us, that we just need to keep going, and eventually it's going to work. And this idea of asking help from anyone else, this idea of being helpless, it just kills us. And so we decide, you know what? I don't, I, don't, I don't wanna reach out. I don't want anyone else to help me. Or maybe we, just, we really just don't know how. That we came to the faith a little bit later in life and we were never really taught exactly how to pray or it just has always seemed confusing. And so we try modeling it after other people and we pray and we try and our brain gets distracted and so we go everywhere else and we leave prayer just feeling awkward and discouraged that it doesn't really work. And so we'd rather just not do it then try to do something and it doesn't work that well. And there's also probably a, a multitude of other reasons of why people uh, choose not to pray, but that's just a couple of them. But a book that I wanna highlight that has been really helpful, at least for my life, uh, is a book called A Praying Life by Paul E. Miller. Uh, the, our young adult community, we went through this book this last spring, and it has been paramount in shifting my paradigm of what does it look like uh, to be and to have a praying life. Uh, and so, if you're interested, please like talk to me about it. It's such a helpful and wonderful book, but this main idea that um, Paul E. Miller really leans on is the idea that if God is our Father, then we must be like his children, and we must act like his children. And once we understand this relationship and can really live into this relationship, it's going to help us so much, specifically with, this, with our praying life. For instance, for those struggling to believe that it works, that we must trust like a, tri like a child trusts their father. That you, um, for those who have kids in the room or if you can remember when you were a child, that whenever you needed something, that you would go to your parents and you would have full and complete trust that they would supply it to you or that you will supply it for your children, that they don't ever think for a second that you will not care for them. They, they believe so much in the love that you have for them. And so you go and supply. And so we really need to understand who our father is, that he is the one that truly does provide. 
for those wanting to work alone, for those want, know, who think they can just do it all by themselves. We must live as a child and understand our true dependency on our fathers. Your kids, you know this, if you were to leave your kids out in the wild, they would not, they would not make it for much for, for a long time, that they are so incredibly dependent upon you for everything. And so the, your kids, they ask you for everything in the same way we must be like that. We must be like those children where we know that we are dependent, that in our own deficiency, we understand our dependence. That we know that we cannot do it on our own, that we must reach out, that we must pray, that we must communicate with our Father in heaven. He will supply us our needs. And for those who are unsure how, who don't know what it looks like to pray, I would say that we simply talk, that there is no need for us to tie ourselves up or to get clean or to present ourselves to, um, to our father, but we can just be, as a child comes to their parent, and they don't feel like they need to get clean, they don't feel like they need to do it, they'll just come to their um, parent without any pretense, and they'll just talk to them about anything and everything. That's how we need to be coming to our father that we don't need to clean up our appearance, that we don't need to pretend that we're something we're not, that we can just come simply to him and talk to him. There is such an importance on, on this idea that we must communicate with our Father. And Jesus follows up this ask, seek, and knock with a hypothetical, which brings me uh, to my second instruction, that we must remember the character of our Father, that we must remember the character of our Father. We're gonna pick things up in verse nine. It reads, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So Jesus starts off with this hypothetical. So I'm gonna give it to you. Which one of, uh, which one of you parents, if your child comes up to you and he says, hey, I'm really hungry right now. Do you have any bread? How many of them, how many of you would give him a stone? Hands? It's okay. Maybe, hmm? Okay, okay, you can pass, good job. How, okay, how about this? Maybe it's a Friday night, your child comes to you and you say, hey, let's, let's, go, let's go get a fish fry right now. Let's go out, let's have some fish. How many of you would instead maybe give them, say, a snake? Raise of hands. No one. What if they're really naughty? What if they've been really bad? Anything? Mm, okay. You passed, good job. Saturday pass and you pass. We'll see what happens with uh, 1030 service. But Jesus, he goes, he, he goes and he uh, gives us hypothetical about which of you parents, like you have children, they have needs, and they come to you and they ask for these good gifts. How many of you are actually gonna give them something bad? None of you are. And Jesus tees up, he shows and kind of gives this silly hypothetical just to show really how great our God is and to show really actually the disparity between him and us. Because he follows us up by saying, actually, you are all evil, but you still know how to give good gifts. That right now, uh, in this point in salvation history, that the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet, and he hasn't taken out their heart of stone, replaced it with a heart of flesh, that they are still unable to stop sinning, that they can only sin. But even that, though that is true, that they're still able to give good gifts to their children. And this really points us all to the character of God, because Jesus says, Imagine the types of gifts that our Father is going to give us. That we are evil when we give good gifts. Imagine what a good God, imagine the type of gifts that he is going to give you. That our God is so incredibly holy that he is set apart in every single category from us, especially morally. So while we are these evil creatures, that God is something transcendent that he is something different, that he is so beyond our comprehension. Imagine who that God is. Imagine the types of gifts that he is going to give. We see the beauty of his best gift that he has ever given us that comes through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. In Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ 
died for us, that through his goodness and his love, it is demonstratedly, demonstrated powerfully on the cross that Jesus died for rebels, that he died for sinful people that hated him, that that is just the great character, that even though we are against him, his character shines brightly, that he is full of love and kindness even to these rebellious people. That is the character of our God and something that we have to fight to remember. Because as we go through life, there's going to be struggle and hardship and strife that come screaming against us again and again and again. And the temptation at times is to begin to doubt that character of who God is. And when we begin to doubt the character of God, we stop going to him for prayer. When we don't actually believe that he has our best in mind, that we're not gonna talk to him, we're not gonna believe him, the second that we're like, God, I actually don't know if you truly are good. The gates will close, we will no longer knock at the door, we will no longer go to seek him, we will no longer go to ask him, because why would we if he's not going to supply our needs? And this is a real thing that we're all going to have to struggle with. I know this has been the struggle of mine this summer. In June of, the beginning of June of this summer, one of my groomsmen, um, Ian, passed from cancer that he was 26 years old, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer last November, and throughout a long and hard fight, he unfortunately passed. And it's been the question of wrestling of like, God, why, why is this happening? Why are you doing this? Why are you taking away someone who is living for you and, show, and using his gifts and following you? Why are you doing this? And are you actually really good? Why would you take someone with so much so much life left to live and so much ability to grow your kingdom. Why are you going to do this? And the answer sometimes can be that we go and we become callous and we choose to forget and we choose to sit in anger. And when you are struggling through those hard things, it is hard. I don't wanna downplay, I don't say we should jump immediately from being in pain and ignore it all and say God's good and happy, but we have to eventually move forward. A psalm that was incredibly helpful for me, for us all, Psalm 13, it reads, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. That David paints this picture of pain and frustration and anger, anger towards God. God, what, how long are you gonna forget me? How long is this going to keep going on? Do you truly know who I am? Do you truly love me? But David doesn't just sit there, and neither should we. We, should know, we shouldn't sit in anger and callousness towards God, but we should eventually move towards the remembrance of who God is. That David, eventually, he ends with, but despite everything that's going on, despite all these things around me that, show, that, that point to me that you're not good, I will remember your character. But I choose to remember that you are good, that I trust in your unfailing love, for he has been good to me. That when we're in despair, when we're going through hardship, our choice is either to doubt who God is, that we become callous, that we don't want to remember. Instead, we'll just sit in angerness and bitterness and close the gates of connecting with our Father, or we can choose to remember who God is. We can choose to remember how good he is. We can choose to remember everything that he has done. We can choose to remember the cross. And I think one of the best ways that we remember the reality of how good our Father is is by the good gifts 
that he gives us. Which brings me to my last instruction that we must trust the gifts of our Father. That we must trust the gifts of our Father. And so, uh, we're, I'll just read verse 11 real quick. It says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? That Jesus, again, he gives the comparison of humans to him, and there is this stark contrast of, though you are evil, you give good gifts, but imagine the type of gifts that your heavenly Father will give you, that he is this amazingly, perfectly good being. So imagine how much his love is for you, and imagine the types of gifts that he will give you. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father, heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadow, that every gift is from him, and every gift is good. And you might say, ah, no, Garrett, there's been things that God has given me that they have not been good, that they have been hard, and I do not know why God is giving them to me, that I actually don't see them as a gift. But again, this is the moment where what are we gonna do? Are we going to forget or are we going to trust in God that all of his gifts are good? Here's an example. If your child comes to you and says, hey, for dinner, I just wanna have candy, what are you gonna say? No, of course, you're gonna say, no, that's bad for you. I'm not gonna give you candy for dinner. I'm not gonna give you what you want because I know what's best for you. Or how many of you, if your child comes to you and they say, hey, I wanna do this thing that's gonna be really, really fun, but it's probably gonna be really, really dangerous. What are you gonna tell them? No, you're gonna say, no, I'm not gonna let you do that. Or they come to you and they're like, hey, uh, your 13 year old's like, hey, can I come and drive the car a little bit? You know, I've been watching you for a bit. I know exactly what I'm gonna do. You're gonna say like, oh no, like not yet, not yet. You'll have your time. Maybe in a couple years we'll start. Uh, but right now, it's not yet. I don't wanna give it to you right now. I wanna wait for you to mature a little bit. We know that's true for our parenting, but why is it when we are the children and God is our father that we forget that truth? That we always want our prayers to be answered yes, and only yeses are good and no's are bad. Why is it that we forget these truths that actually God sees it all, that he sees the whole picture, that he has the entire scope of things? Why is it that we actually only want our prayers to be answered, but we actually don't want God's will to happen? And there are times when like I said, no's are hard, that if we're asking for prayer, that we're asking, uh, if we're praying for healing, if we're praying that people will come to be saved, and, or if we're praying uh, that we get the job, sometimes we'll get a no, and that is hard, but again, we cannot sit in anger towards God, we can't sit in being mad that God didn't answer our prayer, but we need to believe, we need to trust, is that, that's a good gift that God sees that those things will actually not be good for us, that he knows what is best for us, and that he has our best in mind, that when we pray for healing, pray for that job, that we need to trust in who God is, that we must trust the gift giver, that we must trust that he knows what's best and that he is gonna give us a wonderful and good gift, and so, when you come to a situation and you are praying for something, you might get a yes, you might get a no, you might get a not yet, how are you going to respond? What is your gut instinct going to be? Is it to go up and shake your fists at God and be angry with him that he didn't comply with your timeline, that he didn't comply with the way that you wanted, uh, the way that you wanted to run your life? Or are you going to trust in him? Are you gonna trust that he knows what's best for us? In the moment when you've been praying for that job for months and he says no, are you gonna praise him? Are you gonna say, God, you're still good. I know who you are, that you see it all and I still love you and I still praise you and I know that you are good. And in his gifts and when our prayers are yes, are we gonna be thankful for them? 
That there's so many times that we pray towards God and um, he says, yes, here, I will fulfill your request. I will give you what you want. How many times do we actually forget that God is the one that's giving us that gift? How many times do we actually forget that God is actually a part of the equation, that we think to ourselves, oh, look, look at what I've done. I worked so hard to get this job. I've worked so hard to make sure that everything is in the right spot. We actually forget that we've been praying to God and he is the one that doles out the gifts, that he is the one that is giving them to us. How are we going to respond? But in the end, regardless of what answer God gives us, yes, no, not yet, we must continue to trust in him. And it's interesting, as we've just been talking about praying, we've been talking about gifts, it feels like actually the best gift, or one of the best gifts that God has given us is prayer, that we are able to communicate with the God of the universe, that we have a direct line, that those living on the other side of the new covenant, that we're able just to talk to him at any time, at any place, that we're able to share with him the things that we are going through, that we have a Father who hears us, that when we pray, our holy heavenly Father, that he hears and he wants to give us good gifts, and he does give us good and wonderful gifts. And so I wanna put it, I wanna put this into action right now. I don't want you to go home and forget, the, forget about this, but I want us to take time to pray right now. I wanna give you some time to connect and communicate with your father. And so I'm going to give you guys some time to talk to him. Could be just some time to repent. That maybe you've been living in a spot where you've just been far from God. And this is your moment to bring it all to the foot of the cross, to repent from the ways that you are living and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me God and I'm repenting of this. Or maybe it just needs to be a moment of silence, where you just need to hear from God, that you've been doing a lot of talking, but you want your heart to be still. Or maybe it'll just be a moment to praise him, that he has been working so well, that you've been in such a wonderful season of blessing in your life, and you just need to take some time to praise God for how wonderful he is. I'm gonna give you some time just to sit and talk with your father, and I'll close this in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift that prayer is. Lord, we thank you that you want to hear from us. Lord, that we're able just to talk to you about, in our mind, maybe the things that are insignificant in our lives and even the things that are the most important, Lord, but you hear it all and you care about it all. Lord, you care so deeply about your creation and about us, Lord. We're just thankful just for who you are. So I pray, Lord, in the time when we're going through hardship, when we're going through struggles, that we would remember who you are and that we would trust your great and wonderful gifts. Lord, I pray that we would just remember how important it is to talk to you, that it's not just something that we relegate to a mealtime or for we go to bed, but we would make prayer a regular rhythm of connecting with you and connecting with our Father. Pray us all in your name. Amen.